Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this playlist, we've seen that the Riemann Roch theorem is an indispensable tool for studying the space of global sections of a line bundle on a curve. And what I want to show you in this video is the Riemann Roch theorem for surfaces and how it plays a very similar to role to what it does in the case of curves. It is, of course, somewhat uh, trickier to use, but nevertheless, it's very, very important in the theory of surfaces. Okay, so let's fix our starting data here. X will be my smooth projective surface over the algebraically closed field K. And before I move on to the statement of the riemann roch theorem for surfaces, I want to give another version of the junction formula. Okay, so suppose now we have C here is some smooth irreducible curve on my surface. Okay, then uh, I have a formula for the genus of this curve here in terms of the numerical intersection theory on the surface. Okay, so what's that? I'll write it not in terms of just g of c, but in this term, 2g of c minus 2, what's that equal to? That's equal to the intersection product of c with c plus kx. So this is the canonical divisor on x. Okay, and the proof of this is very easy. It follows fairly readily from the junction formula I gave you in the previous uh, video. Okay, so what's this 2g of c minus 2? Okay, uh, one of the ways to look at this uh, uh, is uh, using the riemann roch theorem for curves. This is just the degree of the canonical uh, sheaf on c. Okay, and the point is that the usual junction formula tells you how to write this uh, uh, canonical sheaf on C in terms of the canonical sheaf on X, the surface X. So what you do, you take this omega X, that line bundle there, you tense it with OC, okay, that um, line bundle, and then you restrict that down to your curve C, and that's the answer. So this is the degree of some line bundle restricted to C, okay, so this... Um, Let's have a look at this line bundle a little bit more closely. Remember, kx just means uh, the divisor such that okx is isomorphic to this canonical shift omega x. So you can rewrite this omega xc as O of kx plus c. And since you're just looking at the degree of this, that's just the intersection product of kx plus c, kx plus c, with this c. And that gives us the result. The 2g minus 2, okay, this uh, linear function of the genius is given in terms of the intersection theory involving the curve C and also the canonical divisor. Okay, so it's a nice, uh, wonderful little formula there. Okay, so what's the riemann roch theorem um, on about, okay? So the riemann roch theorem for curves, let's just remind ourselves roughly how that goes, okay? So uh, uh, firstly, you want to uh, look at line bundles, okay? So let's suppose D is a divisor on X. So if X were a curve instead of a smooth projective surface, what you do is you look at the difference between chi of OD and chi of O, and that's just the degree of D. So it's a nice function of D given like that. So in this case, X is a surface, so we can still look at chi of OD minus chi of O. Remember, this is the quantity that you're kind of interested in. This is something that hopefully you've worked out beforehand. And now this is, of course, a function of D. And what is that function of D? it's going to be a bit more complicated. It's no longer the degree of d, but it's going to be given by this intersection number. It's half d dot d minus kx. Okay? But it's still a nice formula, and you should think of this as like some sort of quadratic function in d. Okay, so let's go to the proof of this. I won't do it in complete detail, but I'll show you pretty much all the steps. Um, and I'll prove it just in the special case where d is a smooth curve. Okay, so actually that's not a big deal. So why is that? Uh, if you want to know how the general proof works, okay, it's just a little bit more fiddly and you need to have some uh, technical details worked out. So the first point is that, well, this of course only depends on the linear, linear equivalence class of D uh, because this is a chi of this uh, invertible sheaf or line bundle. Okay, so you can replace D with something that's linearly equivalent to it. And in general, if you have a general divisor, what you can do is you can ma make it the difference of two uh, uh, effective divisors. And in fact, you can make those effective divisors certainly big enough, okay, to a certain extent, where you can uh, use um, uh, Bertini's theorem to make it a difference of two smooth curves, in fact. Okay, and then applying it to each of the two smooth curves and using the ideas here, you can get the final result. 
function, okay? But let's just do it in the most important case where D is a smooth curve, okay? So of course, uh, we have the following exact sequence, okay? The structure sheaf OX maps onto the structure sheaf of D, okay? And the kernel is just gonna be the ideal sheaf, OX minus D. And we can tensor this by O twist um, D, okay? This OD, so this OX becomes OD, this becomes OX, and this is OD, um, OD restricted to D, okay? So that's what we have here. And what we'll notice here is that this OD is this uh, line bundled here, and this O is this line bundled here. So that means chi of the, uh, the difference of the chi's of these two is just the chi of this third one here. Okay, so chi of OXD minus chi of OX equals chi of O twisted by D, restricted to D. Okay, so at the end of the day, what we're interested in, this left-hand side is just this uh, Euler characteristic, chi, of this invertible sheaf on D. And since it's an invertible shift on D, we can use Riemann rock for curves on that D to study uh, what this uh, Euler characteristic is. Okay, so let's look, use that. Okay, so what does um, uh, this uh, Euler characteristic equal? Okay, and at the end of the day, remember we want to show this, which is the left hand side here, is equal to half D dot D minus KX. Okay, so what's going on here? So remember, this chi of ODD is equal to chi of OD, which is 1 minus the genus of D, plus the degree of this invertible shift, degree of ODD. So we're almost there. So the degree of ODD, of course, is just D squared, okay? That's how um, we defined the intersection product. So you've got a D squared term corresponding to this last uh, summoned. And what's 1 minus GT here? Okay, so now we can use the uh, adjunction formula version 2 and just substitute in here to see what we have. Okay, so what is this term? So if we equate D with C here, what we'll find is, well, if you multiply this by minus two, we get minus two G of C, uh, or negative of that. So we get two G of C, and you get minus two times that is minus two. So we just multiply this by minus half to get this term here. So minus half with the C's becoming D. So it's minus half with a D dot D uh, plus KX, okay? And that's what we have here. And the point is that this simplifies very easily to this right hand side here. Here you have a d squared, and here you have a minus half d squared, you get a plus half d squared, so there's a plus half d squared, and there's also minus half d dot kx. Uh, minus half d dot kx. Okay, so you get the same thing. So now we've finally shown that this difference in Euler characteristics, which is this Euler characteristic of this invertible sheaf on d, is equal to uh, this function of D here, this quadratic function of D, which is what we want, okay? And that's the riemann roch theorem for surfaces. Okay, so as I said, one of the most important reasons for having such a theorem, okay, this Euler characteristic, this is the one that's well behaved, but at the end of the day, you really want to know about H0, the space of global sections. So a natural question here is, well, what's a good sufficient criterion for uh, the space of global sections OD to be non-zero? This is a very, very natural question. You want to have lots and lots of good sufficient criteria uh, for this told so that you know you have lots of maps, okay? You want to be able to construct these maps, okay? And I want to give you one which is in the similar flavor to uh, what you see for curves. So one of the things that you know is that for curves, if the degree is sufficiently high, then um, the, the, that those, uh, the degree of the uh, invertible sheaf is sufficiently high, then you will have non-zero global sections. Okay. Or in other words, if you have a divisor that's uh, sufficiently positive in the sense that its degree is large enough, it will be linearly equivalent to an effective divisor. Okay. So to uh, give an analogous type of result, a result in that flavor for surfaces, I'm going to introduce this new definition, which is about NEF. And NEF here is an, a word in algebraic geometry. It's an acronym, I guess, which means numerically eventually free. Okay, but let's just see what it means. So H, uh, a divisor H on this uh, smooth projector surface X is said to be NEF if H dot D is always non-negative uh, non for every effective divisor D. So you take this H and you dot it with any effective divisor D, it's always going to be non-negative. Okay, so remember in this intersection theory, the way it works is that it can be that uh, when you intersect uh, two devices which are effective, it can actually be a negative number, okay? So this happens with exceptional curves, okay? So if you blow up a point on a smooth surface, for example, that's an example where uh, the self-intersection is actually negative. 
Okay, so what's an example of this? And there's uh, one very, very important example there called the very ample divisors. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next uh, video in this playlist. So suppose X is actually embedded inside some projective space. Now it's a projective variety, so you can always do that. Okay, although usually we don't think of it as uh, being inside something ambient. But suppose you have it inside some ambient uh, space. Okay then what you can do is you can take a hyperplane inside that big ambient PN and intersect it with that X to give you a curve, okay? And that's called a hyperplane section. And any such hyperplane section is an F. So let me just tell you why that's true, okay? So uh, what we have to do is we have to say that that hyperplane section, when you dot it with any device, effective device, it's going to have a non-negative intersection number. And why is that? Remember, to compute this intersection product, you can replace H with anything that's linearly equivalent. So if you have a curve around here, you can always move this uh, hyperplane, okay, until it intersects this uh, curve in such a way that it doesn't uh, contain any irreducible component of the support of this D. And in that case there, since there's only a finite number of points of intersection, of that hyperplane uh, with this curve, then the intersection number is just this, essentially the number of those intersection points with multiplicity. So that's going to be something that's non-negative. Okay, so that's something that's rather nice. If you have a hyperplane section, okay, it has this wonderful property: h of d is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, and that's called nef. Okay, so we'll just keep this nef uh, criterion. Okay, in this. Uh, uh, one possible answer to this question here. And it's given by this corollary. Okay, so remember the type of thing that we want to say is that, uh, or rather the analogous result that we want to give um, uh, is that uh, in the case of curves, if you have a divisor which is sufficiently positive, the degree is sufficiently positive, then it, um, it is linearly equivalent to an effective divisor. Okay, so here uh, we're going to need H to be some sort of uh, divisor which is nef and the divisor we're interested in is going to be uh, d okay so h is just something that we need to write down the conditions okay now suppose that uh, d is sufficiently positive in the sense that uh, or, or rather it's positive in the sense that d dot h is greater than zero so we know that um, so d here uh, we don't necessarily know if it's effective or not okay if d is effective, at least we know that d dot h is greater than or equal to zero. But let's suppose that d is just some divisor, possibly not effective, um, but some divisor such that d dot h is positive. And let's suppose further that it has it's uh, it's kind of positive in the sense that d squared is greater than zero. Okay. Then in that case, um, uh, we have the following result: if n is large enough, then if you look at O N D for N large enough, then the space of global sections is non-zero. Okay, so this number here, D dot H, is sometimes called the degree of D. Okay, uh, it's called the degree of D, but you have to remember that it depends on the H. Okay, so if you have, um, or at least this is the degree of D if the H comes from such a hyperplane section as this one here. This, of course, depends on what is the embedding of X inside PN. So it's uh, only relative to this embedding in that case. So nevertheless, you should think of this as, well, the degree is positive, And if I multiply it by a sufficiently large positive integer, it will be sufficiently positive. And then you want to say that this uh, space of global sections is non-zero. Unfortunately, you also know, need this extra condition here that D squared is greater than zero as well. Okay, so let's try to prove this uh, corollary now, and it follows quite easily from Serre duality and the Riemann Roch theorem. Okay, so this is how the Riemann Roch theorem kind of gets used to make sure that we can guarantee spaces of global sections are non zero. Okay, so remember, Serre duality is a key tool to give us effective uh, vanishing of cohomology. So in this case, what happens here? So we're on a surface, so it relates H2 to H0. Okay, so H2 of OND is given by H0 of what? So you use duality, so the ND becomes a minus ND, but you also have this shift corresponding to canonical class or canonical divisor on X. Okay, so it's H0 of OK minus ND. 
And the point is that um, we can make this vanish, we can make this equal to zero if the following condition holds. K minus nd dot h is uh, negative. So why is that? So this is where we use the fact that h is nef. Okay, so this is uh, essentially the definition of h nef. If this is non-zero, then this is uh, linearly equivalent to an effective divisor. So you can replace this with an effective divisor. And when you dot that effective divisor by h, by nefness, this intersection product should be at least zero. But here it's negative. So using the fact that h is nef, okay, uh, this is something that happens. Okay, so let's have a little look at this as a condition on n. Okay, so let's just rearrange this. So we'll put n dot dh to the other side. So n dot dh is greater than k dot h. Okay, that's what this condition means. Okay, so you have this vanishing of cohomology if n dot dh is bigger than k dot dh. So now we use the first hypothesis, this positive degree type hypothesis. Okay, that this is a positive number. So that means that n is just greater than this number. That's all you need. Okay, so for n sufficiently large, and you can say exactly how sufficiently large you want it to be for this to hold. Okay, so if n is bigger than k dot h, which could be a negative number, divided by this positive number, as long as it's that big, uh, then you will have vanishing of this h2. Okay, so that's where we use say duality. And now we're going to use the Riemann-Roch theorem. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, we want to look at h0 of O and D, and the point of this corollary, the thing we have to show is that this uh, little h0 is positive, strictly positive here. Okay, now the first thing to note is that, well, uh, since these cohomology groups, okay, the dimensions are always non-negative, this h, little h0 is at least h0 minus h1. The next thing is that we're on a surface, so there's only h0, h1, and h2, all the other cohomology groups are zero. So, um, the Euler character here is just h0 minus h1 plus h2, but for these ends that are big enough so that this holds, h2 is 0. So this is actually just the Euler characteristic. And now we pull out the Riemann-Roch theorem, okay? So we've got this is chi of O and D, and chi of O and D is just chi of O, so this gives you the difference between these chi's, because you have chi of O plus this quadratic term in a D, okay? And we're applying it to nd in this case. Okay, we'll apply it to nd. So it's chi of o plus, and in here we'll have plus half nd dot nd minus kx. nd minus kx. Okay, so this is something that we have, and this is just uh, some sort of a number for each n. And we'll think of it as a function of n. So let's see what happens when you think of it as a function of n. So here's chi of o, that's our constant term. There's a half n d dot minus kx, so minus half d dot k n gives you the linear part of that. And there's a quadratic term, okay, so there's an n squared term, and the coefficient of n squared is half d dot d, so half d squared, okay. So here we see a quadratic function of n, and its leading coefficient, half dot d squared, what can we say about that? Well, we haven't used the last hypothesis, which is that d squared is greater than zero. So that means that this is a quadratic function with a positive leading coefficient. So as n gets larger and larger, eventually this will go to infinity. And in particular, uh, this is going to be non-zero for n large. Okay? And sometimes it's actually important to know the stronger result that, yes, this actually goes to plus infinity as n goes to infinity. And the rate at which it goes is also something that we have control over. It's quadratic. So that's how we use the Riemann-Roch theorem to give us some control over the global sections of uh, line bundles on a surface. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics. <laughs>